Hello, lovely people. Um, I'm sitting here with one of my very, 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 very best sisters in the world, um, who's planted her feet in Bulgaria at the moment, and I'm here in Ireland. And <clears throat> we're here to just have share a conversation about Mary Magdalene and who she is or who we think she might be, what she means to us, and see where the conversation takes us. And I am hosting a 10 day devotional later this week as we prepare for her feast day, which is on the 22nd of July. Um, so it's kind of this is part of my own preparation of really dropping into the space and connecting more in with her energy again. And um, yeah, sharing what's on my heart around her. And likewise, for see, it's kind of like. I guess, opening up a new level of relationship with her and is curious and was like a bit like, hey, can we chat about Mary? And I was like, oh my God, yeah, like let's record it. <laughs> so we don't know exactly where it's going, but we're going to just sit and ask some questions and share and and see where the conversation weaves us. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for, for the introduction. And also thank you for being so inspired and jumping right on board be like yes let's do it um because as you said i'm on on my end i'm also like opening a new level of connection and understanding of mary and her energy and what she stands for in the world of women and how i've been connected to it through throughout the years regardless if she was consciously on on my mind or not mm -hmm. um, so having this conversation is a real gift i was like hmm, who can i ask about mary <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i've been um i think rendezvousing and connecting with mary for about coming up on four years um I think it happened around 2020 during like lockdowns there was this big opening it actually started through a lot of fiction novels of me reading kind of little hints of her story and then at the time I was doing like a lot of energy work and she became kind of a brighter presence um, and I just had some beautiful experiences with her and really deep like healing moments and um, and at the time I was very like not Christian and didn't have anything to do with the church um and she like led me and she led me to do my ordination my my ministry training and I was actually ordained the day after her feast day which was like so special to me um and since then she has been the woman that has like led me back to the heart of Christ I've also had beautiful encounters with mother Mary and praying the rosary but it was definitely coming through coming through the mess of who Mary is what the world deems of her what the stories have been and kind of finding my way in that I think I probably found a resonance with that the messiness of it and the the conspiracy theories and the the confusion and really finding my own relationship with her and then letting her be my guide so I definitely feel like she's my patron saint and I know some people I've been learning lately about how some lineages of Christianity think that like praying for the intercession of saints is kind of like idol worship and I just want to say that like I don't think Mary is a goddess I don't think she's God I think she was a really incredible human being who now lives in a different kind of dimension of consciousness and I think she has a very alive presence like Christ does I don't think she's a substitute for Christ but I think she's a disciple of Christ who had like a really embodied knowing of his teaching. And I think especially for women, she's like really relevant as a teacher of how to be human and how to try to try to follow this path that Christ laid out, which, you know, the story goes that he was like God made flesh. So that's a fairly high standard and a pretty challenging thing to even try to be anywhere close to. So I think having someone like Mary and also Mother Mary and particularly as women, as guides in this line has been like really restorative for me and has actually helped me make a lot of peace with um, things that I used to think in the church that were like really oppressive to women. They've actually helped me see it from a different perspective, um, which has been really interesting. So I'm excited to see where we go with the chat. Yeah, mm, thank you. Uh, it's like, 
I I think like I even like remember you starting going through the like going through your heart opening for Mary because at the time we already knew each other. Uh so I have been a witness of this like blossoming of Mary's energy in your field. Um and it was so inspiring for me over the years. Um and I also like always felt like this resonance with her energy may probably and mainly because she was a fully flesh she was a woman she wasn't a deity she wasn't a saint she was like a woman living in the world she was living in and having the heart and and like her womb wisdom with her and this led her to paths that were frowned upon by more conservative members of the community um and yeah and how this all resonates with most of the women that i that i know and how if we want to really follow our hearts and our like our our womb and in her knowing we we are we have like this deep fear of like being scorned just as mary was yeah and this makes her so easy to relate to and this makes her so so close to one's heart as a bigger as a bigger sister in a way like this is how i feel her like a bigger sister a wiser guide um so yeah there we go yeah curious where <laughs> all will go yeah no that's beautiful that idea of her like as a sister um and because like we have like in the christian lineage like of course there's mother mary who's like the mother but sometimes <clears throat> as we know the relationship between mother and child or father and child can be a bit tender and i think for many of us um rooting into more of say because in the Christian tradition, we personalize God. We make God like God the Father, and we have Mary, the mother of God, and we have Christ, who is the Son of God. Like it's very like archetypically, archetypically familial. Um, and for me, while initially that can feel a bit like, oh, if you're kind of dealing with challenging dynamics in your own family, it's also been through that process that I've had like the most beautiful revelations and like openings of healing because God is personalized. Because before I was on this path, I was practicing Buddhism where everything was very kind of like neutral and doesn't have, it's not a specific, um, like what we did was chant to the mystic law of cause and effect, which was very neutral, kind of ambiguous, very non-personal in a way. It's like a presence, a stream of energy. But this, it brings in the archetypes. And so that energy of the sister is beautiful. And I think there's a lot to be learned in it around the sister wound, um, relationships between women. Certainly she's been a huge player in helping me restore my relationships with other women. Um, and like you named the womb, um, that was very much part of, as I connected to her, <clears throat> I was moving deeper into a lot of my own womb healing. And had a lot of density, a lot of pain, a lot of trauma that was stored there and had to go on this <clears throat> journey to like learn how to transmute that kind of darkness and the heaviness. And if we were to go, like if we were to leave all the fables and stories and ideas of who, who Mary Magdalene was like at the door, because there's a lot of, um, yeah. you know, myths through the ages of who she was. And if we were to just look at the Bible, in the Bible, it talks about how seven demons were released from her. So she was a woman who had experience with like a really deep level of darkness. And I think what church history has done for a very long time is demonize that and label her as a prostitute. Like she was literally, they only rebu rebuked the comment that she was a pro prostitute in 1969 like this is the Roman Catholic Church and she wasn't ordained as a saint for another very or consecrated as a saint for another very long time so for a very long time it was like that like she was the fallen woman the prostitute when actually I mean Christ talks about how it's actually the people who have suffered the most that are the most blessed in heaven 
because it's a process of of alchemy and that's not heaven as an afterlife that exists somewhere else it's heaven that can exist on earth that comes through earth through our experience of transmuting our suffering through love and that's what Mary Magdalene teaches us and because she is explicitly named as having had seven of the the demons of like the vices like lust and gluttony and greed and all the other ones it shows that she was someone who had a really profound um capacity for healing and through her relationship with Christ through the alchemy and transmutation of that darkness to actually be able to come into a place where like she was the apostle of the apostles she was the person that Jesus appeared to first when he rose from the dead after um, being crucified and she is present in all four gospels as a witness to the resurrection even when all the other um <clears throat> oh no for all four of the resurrection she's also in all th in three of the gospels she attends the burial of christ and in all four she is a witness to the crucifixion when in a lot of kind of i guess popular discourse on the crucifixion is that like all the all the disciples abandoned christ but actually Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene and another Mary were staying at the foot of the cross and were bearing witness to his crucifixion. So again, there, there's a huge level of alchemy of actually being able to bear witness to someone you love more than you've loved anyone ever in your whole life, whether that is as a mother or as a sister or as a lover who it doesn't matter, but this deep love and actually being able to stand there and witness it, like that's where the transmutation happens. And that's what Mary Magdalene can teach us if we if we're open to her teaching yeah mm. this is beautifully said and what you know like this allegory of the bigger sister and i'm just going back just like a, a little of what you said there of like is it appropriate to to pray or to to have someone like to, to pray to Mary Magdalene in your prayers where she's not a saint, she's not a deity, she's not um she's not in the in the church um canon of saints. Um but she is I, now, but she wasn't. Like she is now in the Roman Catholic Church. I think since 2016 she's a saint. And thankfully in the Orthodox tradition she has actually kept the title of the Apostle of the Apostles. So it, it does vary. But then I also know there's a bunch of Protestant lineages that like don't do not mention her at all. Like she's not talked about. So it varies depending on the flavor of Christianity. She's starting to be remembered more again now for who she was. So in some places she is considered a saint and honored. But I hear you and what you're saying. But I just want to add in the little piece around yeah. that. Yeah. And, and thank you. And this this again like shows that it's there's so many views on mary and there is so much projection happening on to mary that it's at some point it's really very blurry what was actually the truth of who she was and what was her relation relation uh to to christ to jesus to yeshua mm -hmm. um but I thought for a moment there when you were talking about like, well, you know, praying to um, to someone who, who is not or was not the same. I was thinking like how, how many people have, let's say, the loving figure of their grandmother that they're praying to when they're in distress? How many people have their, uh, their mothers who are no amongst them to to pray for guidance for advice and they feel the loving energy and to me like mary's energy is is this like praying to a wiser uh, a wiser woman of of the female lineage for guidance for advice to help transmute what you're saying like uh, to to help or support or even just like witness even like holding her in in your thoughts while going through something like challenging uh, is giving so much comfort yeah. and is supporting doing your your or our own work of alchemizing and transmuting an, a pain unpleasant yeah. emotion that we are we are going through. Um, 
yeah in that it's like in the piece around um praying to the ancestors it makes me think of it's a piece of daniel four's lineage around ancestral medicine but how we actually need to be mindful when we're praying to our ancestors that we're praying to like luminous wise ancestors because when people die whether it's in <clears throat> indigenous worldviews like it's well known that like the dead don't always die well they still have their things a lot of the time and over the grand course of time that gets worked out and in the christian lineage you might see that people go to purgatory or go to some other place that isn't this peaceful state after death and i think they're speaking to the same thing that like not all of the dead are well and when you are praying to the dead you do need to be mindful that you're not um kind of making your life more messy by bringing in what they have like we can get very tangled and enmeshed with what's there in the ancestral world and actually we can kind of circumvent a lot of that and pray directly to god and include those people in our prayers like they get to be part of it and we can work with luminous wise well guides on a line and that's how i view the saints and the scholars and people of these lineages it's part of why i've chosen to center back into a christian lineage is because within this lineage i feel i have a clearer like access point to say like saint Teresa of avila or julian and norwich or joan of arc or um you know these brilliant scholars and mystics who have sat with and considered the word of god for a very long time throughout history in different contexts in different places and help make it like the the god which and i'll say what i mean when i say god is like the presence of love at the heart of every living thing every good act that's ever been done like that's what i mean it's like a field of love and <clears throat> within that that contextualizes different in different cultures and different communities at different times and it's part of what i actually see as one of the gifts of christianity is that it has been able to do that now there's also been like in the face of any high ideal there's also been like loads of damage caused so there's also like a really deep shadow of that and i'm not denying that um but there have been some beacons of like people who have sat with these teachings and brought through such clarity and for me mary magdalene offers that with or without her gospel which was found um in it was actually bought in an egyptian market in 1986 and I'm not sure exactly where it was found, but it was kind of from one of the early Christian texts, like around the same time that the Nag Hammadi texts were found. Um, and some people disregard it totally. Um, but what I'm saying is that with or without that text, she's a teacher for these ways of guiding us. Um, and I would define her as like a luminous wise guide on our line, whether it's a Christian line, whether it's a line as a woman, whether it's a line connecting back to the lands of like Palestine and, you know, the 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 ecosystems where these stories were from. I can see that she's like a guide that can bring us back to those to those spaces. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's a, a beautiful remark. And thank, thank you also like for pointing it out that when we are praying to the to the ancestors really to include or specifically name that we are working with the love and we invite only the ones who are well um because otherwise it can cause like a lot of damages and i also like um for everyone who listens this is um like this conversation around mary is um like like you mel said it a person does not need to be Christian or not to be Christian or to be of any faith. Um, I myself am um, raised as Christian, Eastern Orthodox Christian, uh, but I do not find for myself so much like resonance in this. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, like it doesn't mean that I disregard any of the teachings of love or any of the teachings of like Yeshua because he he often he spoke about love and he's um he's a great teacher of our time and also like mary um as whatever her actual role was in uh, in his life and uh, in the teaching so um it's for me she's like a beautiful 
like wise guy that you can connect with regardless if you're religious or not if you're christian or not if you're pagan or not if you're agnostic or like yeah it's uh it's a beautiful uh, beautiful like wisdom for for everyone this is how i this is yeah. how i perceive it at least and, and i think she actually comes specifically to people like that like i think Mary has a has a pattern of meeting with the people who actually feel really excluded from Christianity's story and um, people that feel judged that feel shamed I certainly felt like that um, and yeah I think it's it's part of her medicine like from what I have found of similar like people who have this kind of affinity with Mary Magdalene there's a lot of these kind of like rogue rebel sorts that are a bit on the edges and Mary has a way of kind of embracing us all and bringing us in and going, no, there's stuff here for you too. Like you don't have to feel, you don't have to feel excluded. Um, and certainly when, I mean, I considered Christianity to be so like oppressive of women and um, like just such a painful lineage to engage with as a woman. And it's been totally through Mary that I've been able to come back to any to any point of touching Christianity, because for me still there's a huge Christian pain body. You know, it lives in so many of us, it lives in our lands, our countries. And for me, it's Mary's wisdom of like transmuting that suffering into love that that helps me engage with it at all. Because most parts of my ego specifically would rather have any other lineage and any other practice um, but I can't deny the, the like embodied somatic experience that I've had of meeting Christ because I have had that and it has been like so deeply healing and restorative in my life. It's been transformational, but I couldn't have gotten there without Mary and I couldn't still be in relationship with any sort of church, even though I don't have a specific church. Just the whole body of like the Christian community is the church and having any relationship with that and the messiness of it. I don't know how I could walk it without Mary's wisdom because she's like, yeah, the ultimate alchemist of it all. Um, I mean, I think Christ is the ultimate alchemist, but Mary is definitely the one that showed me most how to like try to walk gracefully with it when it feels like painful, you know, with a lot of trauma and a lot of pain points and a lot of deep grief, um, a lot of, you know, just here in Ireland naming, like we have the Magdalene Laundries, when I was growing up as a teenager, there was a lot of church sex abuses coming out. Um, and, you know, not to mention the whole colonial shadow. Um, and like, even as I name those, I can feel my heart kind of open and bleed a little bit more. Like it's such a challenging history, but I think that's true for all of humanity as well at the same time, you know, when things, atrocities have been done all around the world in name of every different religion and every different initiative like and in the, the thing is when we have this space of like high ideals and this aspiration for beauty or of creating heaven on earth the opposite is hell on earth because like and this is something i've learned from mary too but like the bandwidth is the full length and breadth of what it is to be human which means the darkest depths the deepest grief the most horrendous pain and suffering like imagining Jesus on the cross or witnessing him on the cross and then the highest depths or the highest heights of love and joy and beauty and it's this dilation just like a woman in labor it's like this fullness of being with all of it and Mary is the one that's helped me stretch to feel this beautiful high side of things but also be able to like have capacity to sit with the, the darker tones of it and not run away and not just kind of go shut down in a trauma response and go oh I can't deal with this but actually go no I need to stay with this because if I can bring my heart to this within the tradition I know there's some grace of miraculous healing that can come through the more of us that bear witness the more of us that stay present the more things can actually like alchemize so that's where I kind of feel drawn and it's totally Mary's um like the image of her waiting at the end of the cross while Christ was dying that has kind of encouraged me in that you know yeah and also like when you when you said like the like the pain body that the christianity is still like having uh around it i think like what you just described is 
basically like really going back to the innocence of mm -hmm. the story, which was a story of love a story of the ultimate love of the of the human and of the divine and everything that everything that came afterwards were just like human shadows and human projections and um and and struggle but this like the back like 2000s and something like years ago like back to the innocence back to where it all like not even like where it all started but like back to this like story of of the of the this love story between human and god mm -hmm. and yeah. um when i am referring to god here um i'm not referring to the white bearded god like what you said also at the beginning this is like the love this lovely parent that we have and for many many years i just like you said like i was at the beginning like because i have my own issues and traumas around family and around mother and around father and to put the label like father on something that i can't see up in the sky or this is how it was preached to be was really like triggering for me so i was really like running away in the other direction uh, but it is like in the last months that I actually started to to sit more with it and to realize that I am a beloved daughter and um, and a beloved woman and a sacred woman as every woman or every man or every child is. Yeah. but just like realizing this for myself has softened my heart and has helped me to relax even more into my into my being a woman into being of this sacred lineage of a woman because like when when i think about it it's just like oh my god me being a woman me being in this body and having a womb is going so far back into the history of of women giving birth to their daughters mm -hmm. and this is a sacred and even like saying this i'm like getting like goosebumps all over my body uh it's just like this this blood lineage this womb lineage is something that's so so precious and so nourishing and it has also like its own challenges yeah. um and its own like pain and shadow but the back to the innocence back to the purity of like women giving birth to women and women and women over time is, is so beautiful and this for me has a lot to do with mary touching more and more my heart mm -hmm. and me connecting more and more with her um and actually like having a more embodied experience of my own womb mm -hmm. and ways that i have been rejecting my womanhood and uh, the ways i have been like uh, rejecting my womanhood but still in a way like prostituting my my energy uh so i do yeah i do find her like really really close to my heart although as i said i'm not really so immersed in the in the christian teachings yeah yeah that's beautifully said that lineage of like mother to mother to mother i'm actually reading this novel it's called the red tent and it's about women in the red tent but it's all the way back to the story of like jacob's only daughter dina back in like this is like genesis in the in the bible and uh it's beautiful like it brings the landscape to life in such a gorgeous way and the women going into the red tent and having their like three days of rest you know like they're on the road now to go home back to jacob's homeland and they've stopped the tents for three days because the women need to bleed and they all set up camp and the women have their three days of like just resting and bleeding in the tent and 
in that story, there's so much about, you know, women giving birth and helping to midwife each other and not being able to conceive and the grief of that and the grief of child loss and stillbirths and tending to the tending to the dead. Um, and like the all of these acts of devotional service that women did and have always done to serve the community. And it's so interesting when you say there about this experience of rejecting your own womanhood, because I've had that as well. Like growing up, I definitely would have rather to be a boy. I was more tomboy. I didn't like any notion of like women being weaker or softer. And I really kind of tried to like not be that, even though I was like I was a sensitive little kid. But I didn't like associating with that. And I became quite like brash and defensive and very angry um, and <clears throat> definitely didn't have any feeling of being a beloved daughter. And the way I related to anything Christian was like, oh, my God, that's so oppressive. It's just, you know, reducing women to their role as being mothers. I used to think being a mother was the lamest thing anybody could do. I didn't understand why anyone would want to do that. Um, and for me, that's all kind of evidence of how much, like, obviously our world is really distorted in many ways. And I think is there's a strong kind of current of like anti-life that's happening in the world. You know, this like death urge that's here in a very strong way. And I think largely to do with things from like the sexual revolution and the way that I was kind of um, not taught to value my my uniqueness as a woman like it seemed more like a burden than a than a blessing to be a woman like it felt like I was at more of a disadvantage and that was terrible and I had to really armor up and fight to kind of get my way in the world but actually relating to Mary and even like going earlier than that when I kind of had my first spiritual awakening I actually had this really deep remembrance of like oh I actually need to be a mother and it was a whole body awakening that I'm still making sense of and kind of living into now in my later 20s. Um, <clears throat> but I think part of what was happening to me was, I, I do believe there's a strong presence that is like anti-family in the world. And I can see ways that my family was kind of affected by that. And um yeah this kind of like lie or this trick of say what we might call the enemy which is like the consciousness of fear of like actually any sense of really relating to my femininity was almost like it just felt like a an expression of weakness and that's how I saw it in the bible too but as I've healed that within myself and Mary has definitely been a guide I've actually come into this place of really feeling and honoring my my feminine power and that beautiful, extraordinary capacity of women to birth life and tend to life and death and be at the edges of life and through the fullness of it, like nourishing and keeping everything alive and going and like being the heart of a home. Um, and like in a way that sounds very binary, but and in a way it is because it's very much rooted with our biological capacity that we have a womb and that we can give birth. Does that mean that I think everybody is just the gen the gender of their genitals and that they're super strictly categorized as that no like we're multi-dimensional beings and in the eyes of god and in fact in christian theology the goal is to become anthropos fully human and fully divine fully masculine fully feminine to become a whole being in and of yourself where actually all facets of this dualistic life are unified as one so like i don't think we're limited by our biological design and equally, um, <clears throat> yeah, I've learned, I've, I've come into a lot more peace with it. And something that you mentioned there um, about kind of like being a woman um, and then having a path of faith, I can't remember what you specifically said, but it made me think of how in the Bible, like God comes to women. Like throughout a lot of those stories, men are going off to mountains and going to temples and finding these high places to worship and having to do 40 days in the desert. But in so many of the examples in the book, um, like God comes to Mary through an angel and says, you are going to have my child. God comes like Jesus comes to people as God made flesh and is with them. And actually Christ's path is a very feminine path because what he was doing was being with the sick and the elderly and the poor. Things that would have traditionally been what women did, like he was 
being with the people. He wasn't just focused on kind of manual labor or being a scholar in a temple. Like he was out with the people, hugging lepers, healing people. And that would have been, yeah, like really rogue and rebel at the time. Like it was like, what? Yeah. You know? And yeah. I think they're part of why Jesus entrusted his ministry to a woman. It came first through Mary. He was conceived through Mary. And then later, he came first to Mary when he was resurrected. And if we go back further enough, in Holy Week, she anointed him or some woman anointed him, which I think was Mary Magdalene. But ultimately, she's a mystery. So there's a woman at either end of this huge kind of the sacrifice of the king archetype that we know so well throughout history. There's a woman cushioning both sides of tending to that process with him. And I actually don't think he could have done that without her. I think it had to be done with a woman holding another earthly pole and making that process actually possible. Oh, yeah. This is like, as you were speaking the last like sentences, I had the goosebumps as well. And um, it's one like be because we have talked offline and um off the air so to say like a lot about like mary and uh in jesus and like the, the archetypes uh and there was something that we i remember as once we were talking um at the couch at home and we're we're talking that the only way like this feminine path could have entered the world back at the time 2000 years ago was through a man mm -hmm. because like women were not given the same how to say they were they weren't even counted in the census they weren't counted exactly. citizens even they, yeah. were, they were a different class they were like not equal. exactly so for this feminine path to have uh, to have like reason more or like to to have been noticed it had to come through a man through a for for me like yeshua was a deeply feminine man a man who was so in touch with his feminine side and he was so leading through his feminine side um and this is what caused like we're sitting now here two thousand years um 2020 years after his birth um, and talking about it because it was so powerful and it was so profound and i do agree that this couldn't have been possible without having a mary without having um a mary a mother like on both ends to 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 help him walk the path and um, role model for him what is to be of the feminine path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think we could take each of those people in the Gospels, say if we were to take Yeshua and Mary Magdalene, um, like and part of why I think she was so crucial in this is one, her energetic capacity to really understand and embody his teachings at a way where she could really kind of meet him, not necessarily as an equal, but as like um, the counterpart to holding his teachings. And I think that was part of him descending into the underworld. And I do actually believe he did that because there's even like, I think Paramahanda Yogananda actually worked with um, Harvard University to do this study where he dropped his consciousness in his body enough that it actually looked like he was dead on a monitor and then three days technically resurrected. So like, I do actually believe that Christ did that. And in that place of his kind of soul becoming untethered from his body for a few days, which I think still had a tiny tethering cord, he was able to descend into the underworld and actually track through this kind of realm of death and darkness that someone hadn't done before. And I, I know because Mary first, um, anointed him uh, with his feet and with the spike nard, as you said. She anointed his feet, and then later on, she comes to anoint his body with the dead, and she stays through the whole process of witnessing his death. 
So I think there is something architecturally going on there with the medicine of the oils, with their inner capacity, their inner union that really helped hold that whole process that she could stay topside in the top world, which you could say is a more masculine role. And he could just send down into the feminine, which maybe is a more feminine role. And he was the man doing that and she was the feminine doing that or the woman. So there's a beautiful union in their their sharing of roles. And equally in each of them, I mean, Mary you know, dropped everything in her life and followed this teacher and then became a teacher herself, which in at that time would have been considered a very masculine role and not appropriate for a woman to do. Um, and likewise, Christ also uh, had his masculine attributes of like being very directive. Like he wasn't afraid to call people out. Like, yes, he was all about love, but he was all about love in truth. And if something was not aligning with truth, he had no qualms about calling out you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the time or going into the temple with a whip. So it's not like he was all this like soft, squishy, hyper feminine man either. Like I think both of them express in their own right a balance of that masculine feminine, like the Anthropos, the Heroes Gamos. And then the two of them coming together also bring that. And I sh I'm sure that every disciple at that time had their own elements of that. But something I do know is that the men of the gospel really struggled with the fact that Christ's ministry was so as equally relevant for women as it was men. Like that was so radical at the time. And they were humans. They had their own, you know, ideas of what was socially acceptable and what wasn't. And just as we all have that throughout the ages, we are products of the context of our time in some way. And it takes a lot to break free from that. So you know, in, if we look at the Gnostic Gospels, there are pieces where the men kind of say Mary is about to teach something that she knew from her experience with Christ. And he says, what, you really think Christ told her these things and not us? Like that he spoke to a woman in private? Like, you know, and I think that dogma of what those men were experiencing then and the judgment of oh, a woman couldn't be a teacher of this way like that. She couldn't be an equal to us. That has held and that has taken at least 2000 years of history. And I think now those teachings are finally landing in a way where there is a collection of especially women, but people around the world that are really starting to remember this kind of more Gnostic and transcendental teaching of Christ. And because we've worked through some of the more kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, kind of some of the more like, like our consciousness has worked through to a level where now actually the radicalness of what he was teaching then can actually finally be embodied now. It's taken 2000 years for us to finally get it, but we're finally getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Not very flattering. <laughs> We're like, oh, now we get it. And it's like, it's not even that we now get it on collective level. It's just like still sparks here and there, but thankfully they're like more and more. Um, and there was like through the Middle Ages, there was beautiful like artists in the Renaissance and throughout time, like there has been people that have been remembering this, like the Holy Grail and the Knights of Templar. And there have been lineages, but many of them had to be in secret societies and hidden underground because it was really heretical. And you would have potentially been, you know, um, murdered by the church at the time through inquisitions for, for even voicing these things. Whereas in, what's different now is that we actually get, get to live in a time where the two of us can sit here on a Zoom call that will be watched by whoever whoever will watch it. And we're not going to be persecuted for having this conversation in our red dresses. You know, like, that's what's different. We're not going to be murdered. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> or may, maybe no one nowadays feels threatened by what we are saying. Uh, and while you're talking there, I just thought of the movie, like the book, actually, it was first the book that became like a worldwide sensation, like uh, and a scandal. It was the Da Vinci Code. Uh, and it actually, the Da Vinci Code is based on another book written in 1982, The Holy Blood, The Holy Grail, if I'm not messing up with the title of the book. Uh, and the, the radical... Um, concept that it was actually mary what what you also said it was mary that christ gave or passed his teachings and she was 
about to become the head of, of his church, not Peter Simon. Uh, and how it all became like distorted and how people have been killed and murdered to to keep this silence. But again, like this is in the coming 2000 years where human consciousness was in a really, really dark place. Like, or at least here in Europe. And then it, it also like moved to the West um, when it conquered the uh, Turtle Island. Um, Something with that though, about the Da Vinci Code, like I was, I've been listening to um, some of Cynthia Borjo's teachings on Mary Magdalene, and I really enjoy her books on her as well. And she was saying how, like, the Da Vinci Code is kind of like there has been this. Okay, one, there has been a demonization of Mary as a prostitute. She was a prostitute that has stuck for almost mm. two thousand years as her label, um, the harlot, the the whore, the one. Which actually, the harlot means the one who fully embodies and experiences life which is a counter to the archetype of the, the virgin, which is the one that is like whole in and of herself and kind of almost like the innocent, like you were saying earlier, the innocent kind of untouchable point in all of us that can never be corrupted, like that pure essence of soul that is just so beyond life. So we have both. We have the virgin and then the harlot. The harlot experiences the fullness of life and the virgin um kind of holds the pure essence of it and they're not again they're not complete without the other like we we need both for a fully a full experience of life but they've been separated and so in that mary has almost been like demoted to just her sex she was a woman who's both sex and that's that but likewise in the da vinci code and some of these teachings around mary being the wife of christ who bared his lineage and had his children that is similarly kind of reducing her to the sex toy or the one who had sex had sex it's still about her sex whether it's about her as a wife and a partner or it's about her as a prostitute it's still actually kind of limiting her story to this woman is just who she was with her sexuality <clears throat> and what Cynthia also offers in her teaching is that Mary is this beautiful teacher of transmuting eros to agape agape being the beautiful love like you were saying of like remembering our beloved identity as children of God and bringing this <clears throat> uh, like sublimating our eros and bringing that love up to God in the most pure expression of us loving God and God loving us that's agape and eros is the more embodied rich full erotic deep, love yeah and experience but and not just love between lovers but like the eros that you feel sitting beneath a beautiful tree and breathing in the breeze and feeling it on your skin and you know, it's like the sensation. The, the yeah. sensual love, yeah. The sensual uh, erotic love where agape, as you said, is this like purest, purest expression uh, of it. And I was thinking about like the, the other day in Bulgarian language, we do have, similarly to Greek, we do have two, two words for love. And the one is lubov. And the, the other one is obich. And lubov can be like, it's mostly used like between like lovers, like falling in love and I love you. But then like the, the other one, obich, is, um, is the, the love that the parent has for their child as well. And it's, it, it's, it's not the, um, it, it's so much like the agape and the and the eros uh, kind of love. So um, you can fall in and out of love, but you can't like you can fall in and out of lubov, but you can't fall in and out of obich. Like it's just there. Beautiful, yeah, gorgeous. I love that. Um, and your linguist nerd bringing the <laughs> your picture. I love that. Um. And going back to that piece of like, say, Mary being demoted to her sex, which I know as women is something we've both experienced of that being such a huge part of who we are or how we're related to that, that it almost becomes like all consuming. 
Um, and very much when I first started coming to Mary, it was through these, like, there's this book, The Chosen One by Kathleen McGowan, which is a lovely um, kind of historical, modern mashup novel of this view of Mary and who she was and this woman getting visions about her. And, and in that, there is that idea that she was like the mother of Christ's children and his beloved that he um, had yeah family with and made love to and there's nothing in the bible that says christ was celibate by the way that's like a non-teaching that's, that's common. decided by the men like the, the priests and like popes centuries after he died on the cross yeah or resurrected on the cross. yeah and 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 who knows and like currently i'm finding myself in a, a time of celibacy and i'm finding a lot of medicine in that process and being able to like transmute the arrows and bring it up to God. So like it does have merit. It's just, it's not the only way, you know? And I think of all the world religions, Christianity is, I, I know many others are too, but Christianity is so in favor of the family and so deeply honors and respects the family. But what I'm finding actually is in my, in recent years, I've stepped back more from the idea of Mary as his lover or wife and just looking at the what's actually there so that when I have a conversation about Mary, it can be rooted in what we see in the Bible <clears throat> and to a greater degree what we see in the Gnostic texts. And actually speaking of her as a teacher, not as a lover or a woman or someone who was in that role, even though that's also there. It's like there's the harlot, the full experience of life, the whole embodiment, and there's the virgin. And I think Mary holds both, just like Mother Mary holds both. They have been separated in our consciousness that Mother Mary is the Virgin and Mary Magdalene is the prostitute down here. But Mary Magdalene was also a, an alchemical teacher and Mother Mary likely also had other children and lived a full embodied life as an earthly woman of that time, you know, and I'm sure she had sex to conceive her other children, even though I do believe she immaculately conceived Jesus. I just don't think she was a perpetual <laughs> virgin who never had sex. I don't think that's true for the times and who knows, you know, but I, I'm finding a lot of freedom in kind of disconnecting Mary from just who she was as a womb bearer, but who she actually was as a person, like the teachings of her heart, the the embodied experience she had of Christ's wisdom as a non-dual master, you know, of, of teaching of the way of love and actually really bringing a voice of love back into the heart of the texts. And it's interesting you talk about Simon Peter because like I'm watching The Chosen at the moment and I find his character very challenging. And also when I read Corinthians or Romans and his letters, like I find there's some pieces that I feel, I'm like, where did he get that teaching? Like, it was him that started talking about celibacy and mm. not sex. And I don't know where he got that from Jesus' teachings. Maybe he did in private. I wasn't recorded in the Gospels. Who knows? But there's a lot of pieces in it where I find him very authoritative and very kind of strict mm. that I find difficult to metabolize. And it's also something that I'm working on because I don't want to perpetuate this division of like, well, Simon Peter was wrong and I follow Mary Magdalene and whatever. I'm like, no, this is a whole complex lineage. And how can I honor whatever is there in Peter and Simon as much as what is there is in Mary Magdalene, even if I don't agree with it, like honoring is different to agreeing. Honoring includes a level of respect and kind of like as we were reading in the Gene Keys during the week, like valor and, and this honor of like acting courteously and with an inner sense of kind of almost nobility that you can gracefully appreciate whatever is there, whether we agree or not. Because in a lot of those novels I was reading, it was like this big kind of tension between either John and Mary or Simon and Mary, Peter and Mary, like this tension. It's all Mama, the background. It's yeah. Yeah. And like, it's not like <clears throat> in the Gnostic gospel, Mary goes to talk about things and the, the, and the gospel of Mary, like all the disciples are like really upset because Jesus has died and they've left him and they're like, oh my God, how are we ever going to be able to teach these things? If they persecuted him, how do we stand a chance? And before she gets up to like share her piece of teaching on it, which does actually like alleviate them, the first thing she does is she embraces them. And they are people who were openly questioning, why would Jesus talk to you? You're a woman. And still she had the heart to stand up and embrace them in their 
worry and in their fear and in their discomfort. So if I'm really to be a woman who Mary Magdalene is my patron saint, I'm not here to start shaming and judging the gospel of Simon and Simon and Peter and the letters to the Romans and people who follow those ways. I'm more interested in how can I embrace them? How can I embrace people who don't believe in the Bible or Jesus Christ? How do I embrace people? Not judge them because that's part of what we're not taught and I fail miserably regularly but that's the ideal that I'm striving towards how to be embracing um, and in the when <clears throat> Cynthia Bourgeau talks about this she talks about how Mary actually offers them a transmission of the heart and it's a level of teaching that exists beyond all words and I hope that there's some level of that in this conversation because as you've named we were women who have sat on couches together and cried together and cuddled and laughed and giggled and shared and like our hearts are deeply woven and I know part of this lineage that we're both connected to exists so much more beyond what we're talking about like it's a heart experience and I hope people listening can have a sense of that and feel that because that's very much where it lives for me and I know for you too and it's part of why regardless of our religious orientation or our worldly labels like we're sisters at the deepest level it's not about what you believe and what I believe it's a heart thing yeah and it's not about exactly it's not about who is right or wrong and it's like that the striving is to also like for ourselves or at least talking about myself to actually go beyond like this drama triangle of who is the victim and who is the persecutor and who is the um, the rescuer? Because like all of this drama is is there. If you want to look for it, we're gonna find it. And the thing is like how, and this is something I'm sitting with at the moment as well. It's like how, and you touched it already. How to actually exit like this drama triangle and stop trying find the victim. Stop trying be the persecutor or stop trying to be the, the rescuer um, when you actually take a step back and be like, okay, there is innocence in all of this and how can I find this innocence in my heart first in, in order to be able to see it in the hearts of others even when they behave uh, in ways that are not respectful and not honorable and uh, how can I find a place within myself to, uh, yeah. to actually uh, see this in them and to see that they're hurting too. And with all that's happening in the world right now and, uh, uh, and the atrocities that have been committed in Palestine, which was the land of origin of Yeshua and Mary Magdalene, um, and it's like, how, like, can I find all those narratives in myself first to know that I am the victim and I am the perpetrator and I am the rescuer all in once and to step back and to actually have compassion for everyone, for everyone else who is, who is also like caught up in this, in this drama and that they, they feel righteous about something and that the blaming something or they feel as the rescuer and the savior and like all those titles and labels. Um, so yeah, this, this, is, this is something that we aspire to and it's easier said than done, but it's, um, I'd say it's at the heart of what we're doing uh, or we're trying or do, we're doing our best actually to say like we are not trying we are doing our best yeah and failing miserably along the way <laughs> like oh, yeah. and picking ourselves up again and bringing that compassion um as you've described so beautifully like i think what you've just described is what christ calls us to do is not to look for a savior who's going to come down from heaven and save us but it is how do we become like christ how do we bring forward our christ in nature which is having that compassion and mercy and forgiveness um, for our perpetual human condition of constantly getting stuck in the drama triangle, of constantly missing the mark, which that's the root of the word to sin is to miss the mark. It's not, oh, you're a terrible person. And like I think it's been added to now that it has so much shame and guilt and this big thing, but 
there's a humbling in it of just admitting, you know what, I try so hard and most of the time what I'm trying to do does not work as I would like it to. And I have to say sorry. I have to come back to my own level of compassion for myself and pick myself up and go, yeah, I failed miserably. That wasn't great. I'm going to try again and keep trying again and keep trying again. And through each time we do that, our heart breaks a little bit. And as the Sufis mystics say, a broken heart holds the whole universe. And we let our hearts be broken again and again and again. And that's the sacred heart, that that iconic Christian imagery um, is that bleeding, torn, broken heart that still is shining light. Like that's what Christ teaches us to do. And it's what Christ actually chose to embody. Like he died a sinner's death. He died the most painful, gruesome, heart-wrenching death possible. And he was innocent. Like you said, there's an innocence in it all. He was innocent. And he still allowed for that because knowing that by totally surrendering to the suffering and the atrocity and bringing forgiveness love and mercy through it all that's where the glory of love comes through and that's where the resurrection comes from and now this now kind of promise of um like eternal life through him is that no matter how many ego deaths we have no matter how many times we fail no matter how bad life is no matter if we're like homeless or we're addicted or we're caught in terrible cycles there is life there is always life there's always hope we always get to keep going there's always potential for god to work his glory through this to for love to transform it all and that's part of what helps keep us going on this path of you know buddha named it as the path of suffering to live in an incarnated existence christ has named it as that like life has so much suffering and you know these things of like these conversations of faith is like how do we live through that our own suffering the suffering of others how do we bear witness how do we get up and pick ourselves up again and go and that's part of what christ's promise is is you were always loved you were always going to be loved it doesn't matter what happens it's going to be okay you're loved you're loved you're loved and when you die and you've lived this life fully to whatever capacity you can you're going to go back to an ocean of love and you're loved and you're loved and you're loved and you're loved like that's the message I had this I mean, we might start to, to end soon but I had this lovely vision that came to me when I was at Douth um, which is a sacred site in Ireland near Newgrange where they would have made a procession to Douth which was almost like the death space then they would have went to Newgrange and did their rites of passage and then they went to Nouth which was the place of birth and the new beginning so while I was at Douth I was sitting at one of the entrances to the passage tomb and I had this image of like all the suffering in the world, all the darkness, like the deepest grief and pain. And at the heart of it was like this image of a glowing cross. And it made me remember and reflect on a teaching I heard through Richard Rudd of how like grace comes to us in the deepest suffering and equally in the highest love. Like grace does not just work when life is going well and beautiful. Grace actually works probably more because more of us suffer when we're in the deepest suffering. That's where grace meets us. And it's like a circle or like a horseshoe of life of like heights of beauty here, the depths of darkness here. And at either end, grace meets us. And it's like that's the eternal faith behind it all is that, OK, no matter what happens to me, it's going to be OK, because that presence of love is actually going to be able to come in. And if your experience is traumatic enough, it can actually take you out of your body. So you don't need to actually experience it. It will lift you up and out. And then when you do come back in, then you have the task, the earthly task of transforming that suffering into beauty. Like that's what we're tasked to do. How do we walk our walk that we bring more love and more beauty and more courage to the path? And we keep going, even as we watch our lover die on a cross, even as we watch our son die on a cross, even as we watch loads of people persecute us for something that we didn't do and that we know we're innocent of. Love is still there and it's OK. Everything. It's OK through everything. Yeah. And um, I know how hard this concept might like not concept, how hard this knowing can be to uh, to embrace, to invite in your own being, into your own selves, to know that 
how how come i have to suffer so much and i'm still loved like it doesn't it doesn't quite fit and sit and i know for sure that i had my own share of struggle with this of like i don't feel loved i i suffer i'm in pain i don't feel loved and then it's the it was the no you are loved you are loved and you're constantly like guided and held in love um but there are also like things and how to say like consequences the consequences of life are that when and this is something that um we are in the pulse of um and also like with the jinkies in the pulse of the 53rd jinky which is very much about like expansion and what expansion like looks like and expansion is not infinite growth it's the expansion is like a spiral it goes like in circles and it's widening circles but it's like this expansion like the highs and then you have the constriction which is like what we describe as a low and then it comes again and then it's a wider wider expansion um and wider i would say it like wing of the spiral and then another one so it goes like in in spirals wider and wider and it doesn't it doesn't mean that when we're up here we're more loved compared to when we're down here yeah and it's, um yeah it's something that is really like this this is like still landing for me um yeah and it has it actually it has the power to change to change the world as it is yeah and that's where the peace comes from is when you really start to get that cycle there's this like it's like the deepest stillest part of the ocean that is never affected by the waves or the wind on top it's like so peaceful because no matter what's happening, it's the same as in the Buddhist teachings of Nirvana. Like there's this point of just absolute stillness where all is well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, to quote the beautiful mystic Julian of Norwich. Um, and that doesn't mean life is easier or we don't suffer because we do. But part of what I see is our task is, and what Mary Magdalene can be our guide in helping us, is to dilate to feel the fullness of it. Because as we do that through our human consciousness, through our human experiences, every time we dilate, we're actually bringing more love into the planet. We're bringing more consciousness. And that's what it means to have heaven on earth. And it's not like heaven is just this, you know, crystal palace in the sky that's going to descend down and it's going to be like a choir of angels singing and it's going to be magic. <laughs> heaven on earth is birthed through our suffering. It is birthed through us bringing love, forgiveness, mercy and peace through our suffering. Every time we expand into another contraction, we're bringing more life through. We're bringing more love through. It is exactly like a woman in childbirth. You can't have the birth of a new life without the pain or the, the intense sensation of doing that. And part of what Mary teaches us is how do we hold high sensation? How do we bear witness to the crucifixion? How do we witness what's happening in Palestine? How do we bear witness to what's happening to the earth and bring love, not just disassociate and go and ascend to some other spiritual dimension? How do we stay incarnated? And how do we stay with the mess? How do we stay with challenge and keep trying to bring love? Even though we will constantly feel like we fail miserably, we keep trying. And the beauty is every little person doing that, every little droplet of consciousness trying to do that, that births heaven on earth. It's not like through one person, it's through many of us undulating and contracting with these expansions of pain and through it all trusting and knowing and believing that that's how we birth heaven on earth. I know that with every cell of my being. It doesn't even feel like a theory. I'm like, this is happening. I know it. <laughs> I'm living it. You're living it. We're living it. This is what's happening. And it's part of why things are getting more intense out there. If we look at 
the way the world is, it's because we're like getting to that ring of fire of when like the baby's head is crowning and it feels like, oh my God, I can't go anymore. My body is going to break open. That's where we are right now. We're at the ring of fire and it's full on and it's intense from every dimension. And we just have to stay with it and stay united together, stay with our asking our luminous ancestors to pray for us, asking for all the help from all the dimensions and knowing that God is stewarding it all and just having our faith there brings us into peace. And so it is. And so it is and so it is and so it always will be. <laughs> also that and you said it so beautifully, heaven on earth is actually a labor of love. Yeah. You can't well you can um bring a child to this world without loving it already it's it's giving birth is a labor of love yeah or most of the cases and i know that they're like traumatic experiences as well and um but basically like when we're the in i ideal maybe like uh conditions the, the the child that's coming through it is loved and we're pushing it with all our love and we're enduring the pain of a childbirth because of love yeah and in that we're accepting that as we birth a child onto earth they're going to have their own suffering they're going to experience grief they're going to feel broken at times they're going to have such hard moments that you could almost wish, why would I birth someone into this? This is so terrible. But love invites us to do that because life wants to evolve and grow. And life is like this grand stage playing out across all of time and space. And God is stewarding it all. And I think figuring things out a bit as he goes sometimes and um, loving everyone <laughs> is a bit like okay, I'm not sure what we're doing here, flying solo, but like, let's go. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's part of like choosing to have a child. And I know it's why a lot of people don't want to have a child these days. It's why I didn't want to have a child. Is I was like, the world is so terrible. Why would I bring a child into this world? But the thing is, you bring a child into this world because of the potential of love to act through that child. What kind of good can work through that person in this world? What kind of beauty can come through that child? And if you get to steward it with the love that you have in your heart, and if you have this kind of faith or whatever kind of faith, you get to bring your love and your teachings to that child and entrust them with all the tools that you possibly can and then send them out on their mission and go, I believe in you. You got this. Come on. We're all in this together. It's like a big <laughs> battlefield of love, you know? Um, this yeah this um whole conversation is making me think of a poem so maybe i could read a poem as we start closing but is there any other thoughts you'd like to share first or does it feel right for a poem no it feels right for a poem yeah okay so this is one of my favorite poems and for me it is a prayer to keep going on the journey of being human um it's called tincture by andrea gibson imagine when a human dies, the soul misses the body, actually grieves the loss of its hands and all they could hold. Misses the sore throat, closing shy, reading out loud on the first day of school. Imagine the soul misses the stubbed toe, the loose tooth, the funny bone. The soul still asks, why does the funny bone do that? It's just weird. Imagine, the soul misses the thirsty garden cheeks watered by grief. Misses how the body could sleep through a dream. What else can sleep through a dream? What else can laugh? What else can wrinkle the smile's autograph? Imagine the soul misses each falling eyelash waiting to be a wish. Misses the wrist screaming away the blade. The soul misses the lisp, the stutter, the limp. The soul misses the holy bruise blue from that army of blood rushing to the wound's side. When a human dies, the soul searches the universe for something blushing, something shaking in the cold, something that scars, 
sweeps the universe for a patience worn thin, the last nerve fighting for its life, the voice box aching to be heard. The soul misses the way the body would not would hold another body and not be two bodies, but one pleading God doubled in grace. The soul misses how the body told the mind, you have fallen from grace. And the body said, <clears throat> erase every scripture that doesn't have a pulse. There isn't a single page in the Bible that can wince, that can clumsy, that can freckle, that can hunger. Imagine the soul misses hunger, emptiness, rage, the fist that was never taught to curl, curled, the teeth that were never taught to clench, clenched, the body that was never taught to make love, made love like a hungry ghost digging its way out of the grave. The soul misses the unforever of old age, the skin that no longer fits. The soul misses every single day the body was sick, the now it forced, the here it built from the fever. Fever is how the body prays, how it burns and begs for another average day. The soul misses the legs creaking up the stairs, misses the fear that climbed up the vocal cords to curse the wheelchair. The soul misses what the body could not let go. What else could hold on that tightly to everything? What else could hear the chain of a swing set and fall to its knees? What else could touch a screen door and taste lemonade? What else could come back from a war and not come back? But still try to live, still try to lullaby. When a human dies, the soul moves through the universe, trying to describe how a body trembles when it's lost, softens when it's safe, how a wound would heal given nothing but time. Do you understand? Nothing in space can imagine it. No comet, no nebula, no ray of light can fathom the landscape of awe, the heat of shame, the fingertips pulling away the first grey hair and throwing it away. I can't imagine it, the stars say. Tell us again about goosebumps. Tell us again about pain. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad that poem came. I love that poem. I love that poem. It sums up Mary's teaching for me in a nutshell. Be human. Be fully human. Feel it all. Tell me about your pain. I'm feeling it with you. I got you. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You'll miss it when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, this kind of like when when I've sat in in like so much pain with within myself and i was like why would i want to come here why why even why i agreed to do all of this and then listening to a poem like this it's like oh yeah tell me again tell me a story of a broken heart tell me again again how it feels and it's like yeah, oh. yeah. And I will say it's all well and good to sit here in our lovely dresses and talk and think about all these things and share them. And it is a whole other thing to try and live it. And it is heartbreaking and exhausting and tiring and full, like, but full of beauty as well and goodness and loveliness. And, you know, it's like it's constantly humbling and yeah, like I said, I get it wrong a lot. I know we all get it wrong a lot long rot like I can't even talk my words <laughs> long a lot um that was a good example but we're trying and all we can do is be humble enough to try and try together and try to be seen in look I'm trying you're trying let's keep trying and know that heaven is being birthed through us somehow somewhere some way and it's all okay yeah without even us trying like not even like not trying to do so, but it has been birthed through us in one way or another, regardless if we are realizing it or not, regardless if we are fond and feel connected to Mary, regardless if um, yeah. this is what we came here for. Yeah, and the 
pulse of love and life and God is working through all of us. And I really believe, like, I know some Christians question, you know, other faith paths and people in different ways. But I'm like, I can see how God worked through my life, through lots of different faith paths and ways. And God meets us where we are. Love meets us where we are always. Like, that's what Christ did. That's what Mary does meets you where you are and all that like I had a dream with Christ last year I'll end on this but in the dream he came to me and said it's meant to be messy and all that matters is the heart with which you do something having a pure heart there's one of the beatitudes says blessed are the pure of heart for they will know God and wherever you are in your life whatever path you find yourself on if you can really sincerely purify your heart and like ask love to purify your heart ask love to be more in your heart than you ask God to be more in your heart than you that will be felt and that will move through you and lead you in a way that like will lead you where it needs to go and no matter where people are even if they're so far away from that knowledge God is still knocking trying to love them the thing with God though is that and all good forces they work with consent so if you're like adamant, like, no, I'm not going to be loved. I'm doing this on my own. Like you can't actually experience it because you're like, it works with consent. Whereas like more malicious and not so nice forces don't care about consent and will kind of do what they want anyway. So if you're unsure and you're uncertain and you're finding your way on this path, I would just say, say a prayer or call out and say, can all the forces of love and good please be on my side? Please be with me. I welcome you. I accept you. I consent. Please let force of love work through my life. It gets to be good. It gets to be beautiful. I get to have this full experience of life. And the beauty is with that then, yeah, we feel all the suffering, but we also get to feel all the glory and goodness too. And that's also part of life. It's not just about suffering. It gets to be good too. We get to have exquisite, gorgeous moments. They are those moments where we get to taste heaven on earth, like through a date or, you know, rubbing a horse or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I could go on and on and on and I would rather not. I know we both could. The amount of like long conversations we have about all of this stuff. And it's 11-11. So it's a nice um, little yeah miracle. <laughs> On my end, it's one eleven. So yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous. So, yeah. It was, it was beautiful, beautiful conversation, beautiful transmission. So thank you. Um, thank you so much thank you for being in it together it's like all of this work like I knew coming on I didn't need to prepare something because it comes whatever we need to share it comes and I know you had a list of questions which we probably didn't go through but we did in a roundabout way but like it's a heart thing it's like showing up with trust that when two souls meet and are open to love what needs to be shared will be shared. So I trust that exactly what we talked about is going to be what's needed. And it's lovely to collaborate like that. It's like playing an instrument. It's like yeah. weaving and God in there too. And it's like a cool dance and we're all here. So beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. It's so glorious if you mess up somewhere in the middle and it's like, nope, we keep going. We keep going. We keep going. We keep trying. We keep, we keep loving. Yeah, Shinny, that's it. That's it. Thank you for being in the mess with me. And also, like, thank you, everyone who is watching this, for choosing to stay with us and being in the mess with us. Yeah, bless this mess. Um, and if you are watching this before, um, what day is it? The 13th of July, which is soon. It's in like three days. But I'm going to do a 10-day devotional to Mary Magdalene where we're going to pray the novena pray a novena which is praying the rosary three times a day for nine days with a specific prayerful intention and everyone gets to bring their own prayers we're going to have a live ceremony on the 13th from seven till nine and again on the 22nd from seven till nine <clears throat> which is mary magdalene's feast day which i'm really excited about and um yeah the the idea is that you commit to a prayer practice devotionally for nine days with a specific intention and we're going to pray for ourselves we're going to pray for each other and we're going to pray with God and ask for miraculous healing to come into the places where there is still pain and grief from the Magdalene laundries in Ireland because that was a big point of suffering for specifically Irish women um, and children and there's so much still there to unpack so it's 
part of it is about bringing our hearts to that and praying for love to work through that um, and everyone's intentions. And when we pray in community, beautiful things happen. So me and Hrithi will be there and a lovely other gang of people and more people are welcome too. And if not, there's lots of other ways to connect with me, you can find Sanctor Cree on Instagram and you can find Trissy, the Witch of Trace as well on Instagram too. And we have kind of other threads, which I will just link below. We can link below. So they're here. Does that feel good? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. And thank you to my beautiful sister for being with me in this space. It's such a pleasure. Such a pleasure and such an honor as well. Like, thank you. Mm.